purely at the state level. And then um, please feel free, you know, after 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, um, for us to dive in on whichever pieces of this are most interesting to you. And if you have um, questions that pop up in the chat, you're very welcome to drop them as we go. I no longer have to teach on Zoom, but I did have to teach on Zoom for almost a year. And so I've gotten better at talking and reading at the same time, which it turns out, at least for me, is harder than it sounds. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing um, my screen. And I think I'm going to aim to mostly um, fly through um, some headlines so that you can get a sense of a, a quick tour of the, the many different chapters in Virginia's recent history of election reform. And there's an awful lot of it to cover. Can you all see an article from the Virginia Mercury from just yesterday right now? Okay, excellent. Uh, I, I'm going to cover what I think of as sort of four big buckets of angles on democracy reform. And, and I'm going to start with one that we used to take for granted, which is simply the faith in the accuracy of elections. There, there was a time where public officials didn't call into question whether ballots were being fairly cast and counted, but that time has long since passed. We know that there are both elected officials um, and administrative officials all over the country now um, who are trying to undermine the integrity of our elections in the public opinion. And I wanted to start by saying that that's not where we're at in Virginia, though we do have a uh, governor and an attorney general who have tried to cast doubt on the quality of our election administration system, at least at the helm of our Department of Elections right now, our commissioner of elections, Susan Beal. We have uh, someone who is very clearly willing to speak up loud and proud for uh, the quality of our election administration. So this article is from just yesterday in the Virginia Mercury, where um, the, the reporter was asking her to, uh, to assess the health of our election administration. She was very clear that we have dependable, reliable elections, all of the audits conducted by our Department of Elections consistently show that. So, you know, we're not in Florida. We're not in Arizona. We are in a state where even though we have a, a Republican appointed commissioner of elections, we still have people at the top who are making clear that our elections are sound. So I didn't want to take that for granted. But um, beyond that, I think that should be table stakes for any place that wants to call itself a democracy. There are uh, three more, I think, um, big classes of uh, things that we can do, uh, maybe four more classes of things that we can do to really invigorate our democracy. And, and the first is to just make sure that it's easy and convenient for everyone to cast a ballot. We typically refer to these as ballot access issues. And this is an, an update to an article from just this week as well from the New York Times that was ranking the states where it's easiest and hardest to vote before I took election in 2018, Virginia was ranked at the bottom of this barrel. We were down here by Mississippi at number 49. We have since vaulted almost to the top tier. You can't see us right here, but we're at number 11. Um, so in the th two magical years where we had a Democratic trifecta in Richmond, uh, one of the, the first things that we did was make it a lot more convenient to vote. And that means that we did things like uh, adopt automatic registration so that when you sign up for your driver's license, you can sign up to vote at the same time. We got rid of voter ID laws, which we know can be big barriers to folks who don't drive or the elderly or people who's, um, who tend to, to have their IDs expire. Um, we now, for the first time this year, will have same day registration, which means that anybody can walk up to their polling place on election day and cast a ballot the same day as well, so they don't miss out just because they missed a deadline. Those are those are all very good things that make it easier for people to cast a ballot if they want to, and that's really important because we know that that's not just problem across the country, but especially in Virginia, where we were one of the, the many states that for many years um, was subject to oversight by the federal government because of our long history of voter suppression. We were one of the states that was that the Federal Voting Rights Act required to undergo preclearance before we passed any new election laws because we had such a long history of disenfranchising voters, especially black voters. So it used to be that Southern states like us um, could, didn't have the freedom to pass our own election laws. We had had such a poor track record of allowing equal access to the ballot that anytime we wanted to change election laws, the federal government had to give us the okay because we hadn't earned that trust. That is the provision that was gutted 
in the Federal Voting Act, Voting Rights Act, and what we call Shelby versus, versus Holder, that Supreme Court decision, um, roughly 10 years ago. And so one of the other big provisions that we passed in 2021 was our own state Voting Rights Act, so that we now hold ourselves to that standard um, at the state and local level. So what that means now in Virginia is that if any local government, like a city or a county, wants to change voting provisions, like say move a polling place, they have to be subject to oversight by the attorney general, because we know that our local governments have a history of trying to make it harder for some neighborhoods to vote than others. So we've done a lot of things to both make it easier and more convenient to vote, like no excuse absentee voting. Um, and we've put in some checks to make sure that we keep it that way, that in lots of little ways that, um, that our local governments don't try to undermine ballot access. So that's sort of bucket number two. There's faith in election integrity, and there's ease of ballot access. Bucket number three, where we've made huge prog progress in Virginia is in redistricting reform. Um, as many of you know, I'm certain pretty much anybody on this call, um, the, the one of the most pernicious ways that our democracy has been undermined in the last 50 years or so is through the scourge of gerrymandering by which political parties draw districts so that the seats are as safe as possible and nobody ever has to run in a competitive election. This is a graph from the UVA Center for Politics that plots the share of competitive congressional seats over time from about 1972 to almost the present. And you can see the green line is the most competitive seats, so the really swingy ones, the battleground districts, and the blue line is the moderately competitive seats, as they've categorized it here. And then the magenta line is the safe seats, the strong Ds and Rs. And you can see that over time, because of gerrymandering, we see a decline in the share of seats that are competitive and a dramatic increase in the share of seats that are safe, so that now only about that that fully 60% of seats are are basically a done deal for whichever party holds power and fewer than 15% of those seats are now true competitive swing seats and and what that means is that most of the folks in congress don't really have to care about the national mood or how politically popular their ideas are they can just keep casting ballots um, to appease their base or appease their donors um, without a lot of accountability from the um, from the voters. The good news is that Virginia has now pulled itself out of that pile of states where gerrymandering um, is so extreme because we passed a constitutional amendment in 2020 that for the first time in history, uh, in the 400 year history of the General Assembly has produced maps that ignore incumbent addresses. So we no longer let the politicians draw their own lines and pick their own voters. We had what are called special masters, which is a, a fancy word for map maker, um, draw district lines. And so what we have seen in our community in particular in the Charlottesville area is that we have now have districts that are much more reflective of the boundaries of our actual community. So for example, here in Charlottesville and Albemarle, we now have the seat where I serve which is about to be renumbered District 54, which is pretty much unchanged. It's the urban core of the city and the county. And then a, a donut district that covers all of Albemarle and some Nelson and Louisa that wraps around it. And um, that district is um, is now fully um, contained, now fully contains Albemarle, whereas before this redraw, the, the Albemarle community was cracked across three different districts that had been gerrymandered to be very safe Republican seats. So now the Charlottesville Albemarle area is going to have two Democratic delegates, probably, uh, whereas prior to this redraw, we've had three Republicans and one Democrat by virtue of gerrymandering. Um, the this I show you this this map because it's from the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, which scores uh, maps all over the country, and they they have given these maps that were drawn by the special masters of a, a grade for partisan fairness, um, a B grade for competitiveness, which is largely about the the way that population is concentrated in Virginia with um, lots of blue Democrats in cities and and Republicans in more rural areas. And then a C grade for geographic features, which they identify as uh, avoiding splits along county lines. There is There are some tweaks you might suggest to these maps to make them um, more contiguous with county lines. For example, you could imagine making Nelson whole 
instead of having this little slice of Louisa. Um, that's a, a consequence of sort of a quirky choice that the special masters made to nest uh, House of Delegates districts inside of congressional districts. And so this little quirky part over here is tucking into the corner of a congressional district as well. So there's, um, I don't I don't know anybody who um, supported the redistricting process that we chose, um, myself included, who thinks it was a perfect process, um, but by the historic yardstick of trying to end the practice of having politicians draw their own district lines, it's a huge step forward for Virginia and, and means we're going to have really the most competitive elections in Virginia history next cycle when we're all back on the ballot. Um, so the, the point of redistricting is that we think um, politicians shouldn't pick their voters, that, that voters should pick who they want to vote for. Um, the next bucket that I would talk to you about um, is a reform that helps make sure that voters can vote for who they really want once they're in a district that makes some sense. Um, and this is a project that I've been passionate about for some time called ranked choice voting. Um, a ranked choice election is one where you don't just vote for one candidate, you get to rank the candidates in the order that you like them. And that's really valuable in races where a lot of people run. And that's important because we're seeing more and more people run for office every day, both in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. We have wide fields on the ballot almost every year now. And when our, our ballots only let you vote for one candidate, you can often end up splitting the vote and, and make it hard to identify who really has consensus support from their community. So ranked choice voting is, is a potential solution to that problem. This is an article from just yesterday in the Washington Post highlighting the progress that we've made on ranked choice voting in Virginia. Um, I carried a bill in 2020 that will now for the first time authorize Virginia cities and counties to use ranked choice in their local elections. Arlington County has already identified that they plan to take up that option next year and both Albemarle and Charlottesville are considering it now as well. So I'm happy to dive deeper on that if you want into the details if that interests folks, um, but maybe just as a preview, leave it there. And then, um, if, if redistricting ensures that the voters get to pick the politicians and ranked choice voting ensures that everybody gets to vote for who they actually want, the, the other big one that we have to talk about, of course, I think, is um, campaign finance reform. And I'm, excuse me, I'm waiting for my cursor to come back. Um, I think of campaign finance reform is all about ensuring that everybody only gets one vote, that you don't get to speak louder just because you have more money. Um, and right now, Virginia has some of the worst election laws in the country. We're pretty much the wild, wild west. We live um, in an environment where there are no limits on uh, campaign contributions. There's no limits on who can contribute, like corporations or regulated monopolies, like Dominion Power, which, of course, is a, a priority for anybody who cares about environmental work. Um, I want to be very clear that this is a bipartisan affliction, though um, the House GOP members were the ones who killed the campaign finance reform measures in the spring of 2022. It was Democrats in 2021. So this is something that neither party has managed to uh, kick its addiction for, but it, it's got to be a part of, of any serious package of election reforms in, in Virginia and really across the country, because we know that, that now too often there are entirely too few public servants um, who are, are really trying to serve the public and a lot of them who are way too reliant on keeping their donors happy. So that's sort of my um, quick warp speed um, flyby of big picture topics in threats to democracy. There's confidence in the integrity of our elections. There's access to the ballot in terms of how convenient it is to cast a vote. There's uh, districting, which controls how competitive the elections are and how community rooted they are. Um, and then I think of ranked choice voting and campaign finance reform as two things we can do to really help the voters' voices be heard in a more authentic way and not just drowned out by donors. So that's that's a flyby, but I would love to dig in on any of those pieces that interest you more. And I see a, a comment in the chat from Dave about ranked choice. I'm happy to dig in there if if that's where folks would like to talk. Is that a good place to start, Dave? Maybe I'll start with you there and then others um, can think on where they might want to follow up. Um, let me ask, maybe just for a show of hands, how many of you feel like you're familiar with the mechanics of ranked choice? It's something that, that you've seen before. Okay, well then I'll, I'll explain sort of briefly. Um, in a ranked choice election, you don't just vote for one candidate. You get to rank the candidates in the order that you like them. There are now two states 
Maine and Alaska that use ranked choice voting in federal elections and many, many cities nationwide, including some of the biggest like New York and Oakland um, that use it at the local level. This here is a ballot from Alaska, which uses ranked choice for their state and federal elections. And you can see this ballot is from just last month during a special election for the U.S. House. There was a, a seat that was vacated midterm, and so they had to fill um, a congressional seat in August as opposed to during the midterm election. Um, and you'll see down here, if we zoom in on this sample ballot, that there were three candidates, at least one of whose name I suspect you might recognize, Nick Begich, Sarah Palin, who of course ran for vice president um, in 2000, goodness, eight, um, and Mary Patola, um, who was the Democrat. You'll see there are two Republicans and one Democrat on the ballot in a ranked choice election. You sometimes have more than one candidate from the same party running at the same time. And you can see that what the ballot allows you to do is rank the candidates in the order that you like them. So your first choice, your second choice, your third, and in, in this case, Alaska has write-in elections as well, so you can fill in there. And then in a ranked choice election, when all the ballots are cast, you start by counting up all the first choice votes, which is what's plotted here in this graph from that August 16th election. You can see from this plot of round one votes where you're just counting the first choices, that first column, that the Democrat, Mary Patola, was ranked uh, first on about 40% of ballots, and that the two Republicans combined had the remaining 60%. So Sarah Palin had just over 30% and Nick Begich had um, just under 30%. So combined, there were more conservatives or people whose first choices were conservative leaning than there were Democrats, but no candidate had really earned majority support from this electorate. They were split sort of evenly um, across the three piles with Mary Patola in the lead. Um, if in a ranked choice election, if nobody demonstrates that they really have majority support, then we conduct what's called an instant runoff, where we knock off the lowest vote getter and transfer their voter support to their second choice. So in this case, Mr. Begich got wor was the, the worst finisher in the first round. And so he's eliminated from contention. And we look at all of Nick's ballots and ask who their second choice was and transfer their support to their second choice candidate. That's what these pink bars on top of the purple are counting. And you can see that once we do that, that a sizable share of the people who supported the Republican Nick Begich actually supported the Democrat Mary Potola in the second round. So their ranking was first choice Republican, second choice Democrat, third choice the other Republican. So that in total in the second round, uh, the candidate Potola had majority support um, and Sarah Palin did not and, and ended up losing that election. Um, what we see, what I think we learned from the Alaska example, which I think has been pretty evocative for a lot of people, is that there are still crossover voters in this country. There are people who are willing to vote for, say, some Republicans, but not all Republicans, people who would like a moderate Republican or a moderate Democrat, but for whom a more um, right-leaning Republican is a, not something that they're attracted to. And so for that reason, um, ranked choice is thought to be something that tends to moderate extremism and uh, allow for elections that build consensus among communities and allow people to identify issues that they have in common as opposed to being so divisive. Um, if you think about what I think of as the poster child for why ranked choice is necessary, I go back to the primary elections um, in South Carolina uh, where Donald Trump was first picking up, stream in, picking up steam in the spring of 2016. And there were a whole bunch of candidates running for the Republican nomination for governor, and Donald Trump was winning by only a third of the vote or so. And that's because there was no way for the more moderate voters to put never Trump on a ballot. They were sort of split between these other more moderate candidates like Rubio and Bush and Kasich. But because they could not agree amongst themselves in the, the smoky back room who was going to consolidate the moderate vote, you ended up having an extremist candidate plow through the primaries without really winning broad consensus support by only rallying a small minority. So this is sort of the problem that ranked choice is designed to solve. 
And the Sarah Palin case suggests to some folks like me who are excited about this, that um, it could work exactly as intended, which is to um, identify folks who might cross parties at times as opposed to nailing down the party line. Um, I see we've got some folks from, uh, let's see, uh, Audrey. Audrey, is it all right if I drop your comment in the chat for everyone? Just, I think you sent it directly to me. I gather Audrey is also not feeling well. And so um, you see this. Um, let's see. Uh, you were asking about same day registration um, and about young people, um, but whether or not it will make more work for election officers. Um, it, the, so let's talk through sort of concretely how same day registration works. If you are not registered to vote, and you roll up to your polling place on November 8th this year, you will not be able to cast a typical ballot. You'll cast what's called a provisional ballot, which is a special ballot, ballot where they're identifying that your ballot needs to undergo some additional scrutiny before it can be counted toward the total tally. And the reason for that is that they need to make sure that nobody is just hopping from polling place to polling place and casting multiple ballots during the election. So the people, if you try to same day register, you will cast a provisional ballot at one polling place. And then once all the provisional ballots have been identified, the, the poll workers or the election department will make sure that nobody has, has cast multiple ballots across multiple locations uh, and only count one of them. And provisional ballots do take a little bit more work for election officers because they don't get to put that voter into the typical stream of everybody else. The provisional ballot process is a little bit more onerous. I uh, would love to hear firsthand reports from our election officers this time around about what what of it goes well, what of it is burdensome. We know, we know we have really long election hours and that those days are a pretty heavy lift for the, the people who do that critical work. So we're grateful for everyone who does it. Um, it has been, uh, by it, I mean, same day registration has really been a game changer for voter turnout among young people in places that have adopted it. We so often see that young people don't really plug into an election until it's in the news a few days out. And so if there are voter registration deadlines three or four weeks before the election, oftentimes they don't make the cut, especially if they've been moving around. And so it's um, for people who are invested in making sure that um, that transient populations um, and, and students in particular are able to, to vote, same day registration has been really important. And I'm glad to see, as Audrey just wrote in the chat, that we're gonna have some more election officers on hand um, to, to make this all go. Um, you know, I, let's see, I see a comment from the serve students about, uh, campaign finance reform measures, uh, and whether they have any chance of getting passed during the upcoming session. Uh, I will tell you that I think the outlook is probably pretty bleak. Um, it's a short session, which means there's not a lot of time for deliberation. We will only meet for six weeks. We have a divided government, in Richmond with Republicans in the House and, and Democrats in the Senate. Um, and I, I don't think that there are going to be really strong prospects for campaign finance reform until after the Senate turns over in uh, 2023, because some of the most adamant opponents to campaign finance reform are very senior senators, Democrats and Republicans. Um, that when when Democrats had control of the House in 2021, we passed several campaign finance reform measures and they ended up dying in the Senate at the hands of Senate Democrats. So there's um, there's still a lot of work to be done in both parties on that front. The just so you have a sense of where the the growing edge of campaign finance reform is in Virginia, the most aggressive measure that we've managed to pass thus far, which is really tiny by any measure, is that we are finally going to start having our campaign finance reports audited um, after this election cycle. So right now, when I submit um, my fundraising and spending tallies every quarter, there's no one who ever follows up to make sure that those are true, that the, the money that's going out is actually being spent on what I spend it on. Starting after this election cycle, we will have random audits so that 5% of candidates will be asked to produce the bookkeeping records that justify their reports. 
with the idea that if you only test a handful of people, everybody has to be ready in case they get audited. That will be a huge step forward for campaign finance reform and lays the tracks for other pieces because until you have an audit system in place, it really doesn't matter what restrictions you pass on anything else. Um, you'll have because you'll have no way of enforcing them. The the next piece that um, we are trying to bite off by we I mean folks who support campaign finance reform is to end the spending of campaign finance on personal use. So Virginia is a state where you can still use all your campaign funds to you know buy video games or travel tickets um, or fancy clothes, um, and I think that that really undermines people's confidence in elections if they think that people are raising money so they can have their own personal gravy train. Um, I will say that that, um, fortunately, this year, I think that bill got some more thoughtful scrutiny about what really qualifies as a campaign expense and what is unethical personal use. I think as particularly as more women have gotten involved in public service in the General Assembly, we are seeing an expanded list of exceptions to that ban. So recognizing that things like childcare and even some wardrobe investments up until a, um, uh, you know, up until some kind of cap are actually a really important part of running for office. You know, it does, it does take perfect, you know, professional wardrobe. It does take um, childcare in order for a lot of women to be able to do this in particular. So uh, I think that conversation is getting more nuanced and moving in the right direction, but we're still a long way away from the kind of deep structural stuff that we need. In particular, um, I carried a bipartisan bill last year to ban contributions, campaign contributions from uh, regulated utilities like Dominion Power, and that bill still hasn't really gotten a fair hearing. So we still got a long way to go for folks who care about campaign finance and the climate in particular. Um, Kirk asked, the fifth district boundaries were redrawn. The district is more compact, but it's not more competitive. What are my thoughts on this? Um, my thoughts are there's a lot of Republicans in our region, and that's just the reality of where we live. Um, you know, Charlottesville City is home to 50,000 people at our most expansive definition of our MSA, the one that goes down to Fluvanna and Buckingham and everywhere in between. The Charlottesville metro area is only 250,000 people. A Congressional district has 800,000 people. So there is no way to let Charlottesville alone really drive the bus uh, uh, on the partisan makeup of a congressional district. It's, it's always going to be at least three times as big as the broadest possible definition of the Charlottesville community. So the reality is we just we live around a lot of Republicans. The the only way really to draw a seat in this region that could reliably elect a Democrat would be to draw a dumbbell sort of that goes around the Charlottesville area and maybe runs down 64 and then grabs the Western suburbs of Richmond. You could imagine a district kind of like that. And um, so there were, th there were some people I think who were hoping we might have Congresswoman Spanberger represent us if we did that. But there's a word for that and it's gerrymandering. Um, any, any district that intentionally tried to pack Charlottesville Democrats with Richmond Democrats would be a pretty naked gerrymander. Uh, and so I think I think the special masters did what was fair and, and restore the district that we have to something like the old fifth, which was central and south side. Um, and so I think that if we if we want to be more competitive, um, we're going to have to do it the old fashioned way and and do some voter persuasion and, and mobilization. The the challenge is there's only so much you can do for competitiveness with single member districts, um, because there will always be these geographic um, features that tend to to put some people of one tilt or another in the same spot. Um, in, in particular, where we live, the biggest driving force of our maps is that the ninth congressional district has to start in the corner of Virginia, and it has to grow out from that corner, and it can't take Roanoke over because then its population would get too big, and it has to kind of fork around Roanoke, and then and then all the dominoes fall from there. Um, if you if you take the Blue Ridge then as a natural barrier, then it makes sense for the sixth to go down the valley and for the fifth to come up on the other side of the Blue Ridge. And the, the practical reality is if you do that, you're going to end up with three red districts out here in Western Virginia. Um, so the SERP students asked, are there any bills related to democratic reform that Republicans might be more receptive to this session? I am... Um, 
I would say hopeful, not quite cautiously optimistic that uh, we may be able to make some headway on ranked choice this session. The ranked choice voting is like a lot of election reforms. It's a measure that has enough votes to pass on a bipartisan basis if it makes it to the House floor. But if the House Republican leadership chooses not to support it, it will die in committee. And that's what happened last session. I know that we have at least two or three really passionate ranked choice supporters in the Republican caucus, Delegate Davis out in Virginia Beach, um, Delegate Freitas in Culpeper, um, a couple others. So uh, there are enough bodies in the room to pass another ranked choice bill if um, we can get it to the floor. But up until now, the, the House Republican leadership hasn't wanted to turn over the apple cart quite that much. It's a shame because it's not a, a partisan issue. And there are plenty of examples of Republicans in Virginia using ranked choice in their uh, own party nominating contests, both in uh, 2021 when they nominated Glenn Youngkin and that slate, and then also this year in their nominating contest for congressional candidates in primary. So there's very clearly grassroots support among Republicans to use ranked choice. The question is whether the, the party leadership is ready to get there too. Um, the other bill that's sort of of that ilk where there are enough votes to pass it on the floor, we just can't get it out of committee, is the automatic restoration of voting rights for formerly convicted felons. Um, that's a bill that where we even know we have a Republican chief patron in Chesterfield, Del Chesterfield delegate, Mike Cherry, um, who's really passionate about the issue. Um, and if we get it to the floor, we have enough votes to get it out. But um, the Republicans in um, Richmond have decided that they're not quite ready to let everybody vote even after they've done their time. Mm -hmm. So I think that will have to go on the list of things that awaits a new house. Anything else? Well, uh, that's been, oh, go ahead. Well, you know, we still have a long ways to go, it looks like, on some of the political persuasion of voters in the uh, 5th District. As, as I was relating my story to you earlier, there's this a, a terrible attitude out there um, amongst some of the local citizenry. So, so how do we deal with that? Is there any uh, particular way? I, I mean... When I saw the person on the corner in orange, I was in shock, quite frankly. It was just so obscene. Um, that really concerns me. And aside from our election reforms, I, I see that you're doing everything you can. You're doing a great job. Uh, but if you have any thoughts on the uh, particular partisanship that's going on, I, I'd be glad to hear it. Sure. You know, I think part of the problem is that persuasion is difficult when you don't consume the same media streams, because we're not mm -hmm. really starting with the same facts. And that is really a challenge, particularly in regions like ours, where the local news network has been hollowed out in Central and South Side Virginia. Um, even the daily progress is, as you know, kind of on the ropes right now in terms of of reliable reporting staff. Um, and so it's it's difficult to do persuasion when you um, can't even really control which stream um, folks are are getting their their news and their communication through. Um, so I, I think that in a really big, long arc sort of way, that has to be um, part of the solution is is more investment in public and nonprofit media that speaks to a, a wider range of people. I'm, I'm really grateful to the work that the Cardinal News has done, the, the former um, Roanoke Times uh, editorial board leader, Dwayne Yancey, has taken that up as a nonprofit project and is now doing more reporting on, Central, on Southside Virginia in particular. That's part of it. Um, the other piece that I would say is that, you know, I know that anecdote that you cited is pretty painful um, and all too common. I, I guess I wouldn't start with them, 
I, I think that the, you know, that's probably the, the furthest fringe of that corner of the political spectrum. And we don't have to win all the votes. We just have to win half of them. And there are a set of people closer to the middle who I think are um, really starting to get more um, cognizance of just how destructive to democracy their current Republican candidates are. You hear that more and more in talking with moderates who have tuned into the uh, January 6th insurrection uh, hearings in particular, and um, that Do that Bob Good is a bridge too far, our, our current congressman. So uh, I think that I think people are starting to, to wise up to the consequences of extremism. I think that getting ranked choice voting into primary elections is a big part of what will um, help unshackle the Republican Party from that extremist wing. There's also a, a very small sleeper bill that may not be on your radar that is worth flagging that I think is going to be really helpful. In 2021, um, we passed a bill carried by a colleague of mine, Dan Helmer, uh, that made clear that parties cannot use nominating contests that uh, systematically preclude the participation of protected classes like veterans and the disabled. And though that sounds sort of very broad in concept, it has a very practical consequence, which is the conventions that have typically been used to nominate candidates like Bob Good will no longer be viable because if you're a veteran and you're stationed overseas, you can't participate. And so the practical consequence of this law will be, and this was very much Dan's intent because he's a clever guy, um, was to identify a source of um, common support, which was we want veterans to be able to vote, that has a practical consequence of eliminating tiny backroom conventions that nominate extremist candidates and will very likely drive um, most Republican nominating contests to become full state run primaries, like the kind that we're accustomed to for Democrats in the Charlottesville Albemarle area, so that many more thousands of people will go cast their ballots at a formal polling place rather than uh, a convention with a few hundred people, which is the mechanism by which Bob Good ousted Denver Riggleman, who is a much more um, moderate candidate. So my sense is that to your question, Kirk, I think it will be more difficult for, for us to swing by us, I mean, me and my Democratic colleagues to swing a lot of votes in Central and South Side to the Democratic column. I think the, the partisanship there is just pretty deep and bitter. But I think there are practical ways for us to assist the Republican Party in identifying uh, more moderate and mainstream candidates and being being less beholden to a really rabid base. Frank choice and no no conventions. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Those would be I think those are both practical things. Yeah. So how do you accomplish that? Particularly the no convention, because they have the option, is that correct, to do, do it either way? No. So that's they do now, um, but that's about to become illegal thanks to the bill that I was describing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So we're working on it. That's great. Thank you. It's very difficult to get elected officials to vote to change election rules, because by definition, everyone who can vote like knows the rules that they want on the first time, and they can often be very scared to change the rules out from under their own feet. And they keep doing that all the time, it seems like. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah. We've had some problems. The Mountain Valley Pipeline really keep changing the rules as they move down the road. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions this evening? And um, for Sally, I think we covered a lot of ground in a very short time. Um, I appreciate your interest in the topic. I think, like we said at the top, um, anybody who's as passionate as all of us are about thoughtful environmental policy, I think eventually has to get passionate about democracy reform because the science has in many ways been settled for as long as I've been alive. And so there's clearly 
uh, not a without without some election reform, there's not an obvious pathway for ensuring that 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 good sound science becomes impactful policy. Yes, we we require a democracy in order to be able to pass our environmental agendas, uh, things that we care about. So um, it's essential. That's true. Sierra. Well, thank you all for having me this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sally. It's great to see you. Take thank care. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to have you here. And um, uh, so thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Anything else, Donna? No, not a thing. No. Okay, yep. Great. Bye, everybody. See you soon.